Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to part two of this NIA characterization webinar. Uh, in case you missed part one last week, you can catch up with the recording on the NIA website. Uh, you will receive the link uh, in the slides after the event. Just a couple of uh, rules before we start. As usual, uh, we would ask you to keep your microphones muted until we open the Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, you can also chat your question, put your question in the chat instead if you would like us to read it out loud. Uh, as I mentioned, you will receive the slides at the end of this uh, event and you will uh, be able to see the recording on the NIA YouTube channel. So uh, before we start with today's uh, topic, I just wanted to take a few moments for a brief introduction of the NIA and what we do. We're an industry association based in Brussels with offices across Europe, and uh, we work to support the su successful development and commercialization on nanomaterials from the lab to the market. So to do that, we support our members with understanding what kind of regulations their products have to comply with. We also provide communication and visibility opportunities so that uh, we can foster end users' trust in the performance and the safety of the materials. And we also support companies in identifying the right place in the supply chain and the best end users for their applications. In order to do this, uh, we work uh, interacting with policymakers, uh, not just in the EU, but across the world to support the development of a predictable regulatory framework that provides a good environment for companies to operate in. We promote uh, scientific networking opportunities so that members of the research community and the industry can come together and better understand each other's needs and uh, latest breakthroughs. And we support the uh, buildup of a whole ecosystem for nanotechnology. And for that reason, our members are not just the companies that produce and sell nanomaterials, but also the providers of those collateral services like regulatory compliance, solutions, and equipment manufacturers, as well as a number of research organizations, universities, and associations. In terms of regulation and policy, we uh, provide support not just on chemicals legislation, but also on understanding standards and the test guidelines need uh, to uh, verify your product performance. We are working on the latest topics like safe and sustainable by design, as well as advanced materials. And we obviously try to keep an eye on global trade trends and the implications that they have for companies that operate in this system. Uh, we obviously do not do this just by ourselves, but by interacting with decision makers in the EU and globally, as well as other industry sectors, the research uh, community, as well as civil society of organizations. Um, in terms of uh, communication and visibility opportunities, you are obviously participating in today's webinar, so you already know this is one of the activities we organized uh, for our community. You can also join a very active and broad uh, community on LinkedIn, and uh, as events and trade shows pick up again after the COVID pause, uh, you can also find us participating in different events throughout the year. And you can also come see us at the Nano Pavilion exhibit space that we try to organize with our members at relevant trade shows. For those of you who are more uh, on the research side of things, we also participate in a number of EU funded projects on different topics relevant to nano, especially innovation, uh, testing and safety. Now, if you are participating today, uh, you probably have heard of us either because you already received a newsletter or you follow us on social media. But if that shouldn't be the case, uh, it only takes a few seconds to register on these. And of course, if you would like to discuss opportunities to get involved at a deeper level, you can also consider becoming a member. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have membership models for pretty much any type of organization. And so uh, if you would like to discuss, uh, do not hesitate to get in contact. Now, with that, uh, I would like to move forward to uh, today's topic, which is the second part of our characterization webinar. And today we're going to start with a presentation on a very specific uh, characterization uh, technique. 
And then we will go into looking at what company needs and their collaboration with lab research can look like. So I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Matt Jellico, who is research fellow at the School of Chemical and Process Engineering at the University of Leeds. And uh, Matt, welcome. Thank you very much for being available to talk to us today. And whenever you want to put your slides on the screen and start your presentation, you're free to go. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so yes, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Matt and I'll just bring up my slides. Um, can everyone see this? I can yeah. only say I see it. I hope that everyone else can as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just let me know if you guys have any trouble seeing it um, in the chat. Um, so the my uh, talk today is about uh, algorithm self-optimization of non-toxic uh, silver nanoparticles. Um, this is a in the SABI DOMA project, which is um, in the e an EU project, which is done at the University of Leeds and a number of uh, places around on the continent. Um, so I'm just going to give you a sort of a, a brief background of what I'm currently doing with collaboration with another postdoc at the University of Leeds, um, uh, Will Stokes. Um, so, so the SABI demo overview is safety by design of nanomaterials. So we're trying to um, progress up the technology readiness ladder. Um, so we're looking at the development of uh, nanomaterials through various platforms. So we're looking at things like uh, silver nanoparticles, titanium, copper oxide, um, along with a number of other ones. And we're trying to analyze the nanomaterials toxicity through an online high sense module, which I'll talk about later in this talk, and then sort of developing a sort of a top score based upon um, cell cultures, which I'll talk to about. So we're directly involved in the development of continuous flow processing for the reduction of various nanoparticles, including silver, and trying to do online analysis of, of the physical properties and toxicology of right. those materials. So just a quick overview, we're working with um, applied particles um, in Barcelona, short terms, APPV and MPS, sorry, um, who have synthesized a bunch of silver nanoparticles in various sizes. And we wanted to try and uh, replicate this um, work under continuous flow. And they were able to give us a bunch of nanoparticles between 220 and 200 nanometers. Um, and we're working with uh, NTUA on designing an algorithm for the controlling of the reaction. So the uh, shorter overview of this is trying to design a, a reaction, make the, the particle, and then increase the safety in regards to toxicity and then go around in this sort of endless loop of making uh, materials and trying to make them uh, less toxic. Um, so for the to, for the continuous flow synthesis of the silver nanoparticles, we looked at using this, uh, replicating this paper uh, that used uh, CFIRs, which is coiled flow inverted reactors. Um, and what we did was we decided to make these squares and then coil the the, the um, tubing around and we're able to make um, multiple um, squares which are classified as growth stages which I'll show in the next slide so we have growth stage one growth stage two three and four and these can all vary um, which is quite handy because we can add growth stages or take them away based upon how many um, CFIRs we have and this is what it looks like in real time. So we've got the the uh, what we call the lead demonstrator in an oil bath, and then we have growth stages, the back pressure regulator helping um, suck the liquid uh, into the collection vial, and then we have a nine weight um, manifold import manifold for the uh, introduction of silver nitrate. Um, and the reason why this is important is because especially with um the silver is we can use real-time uv vis analysis to uh identify what the materials are um and with silver 
they actually have a uh, SPR, so a surface plasmon resonance, which means when the size uh, changes, the UV vis changes. So we can actually identify, depending on the peak position of the material, how big the material is using MIE theory. And this is quite handy because we can do on some online slash inline analysis of the material at the same time. Um, so the way that it's set up is we use these pins and place the 3D printed materials on the uh, pins where we can adjust how many we have. Um, and then we place it into an oil bath where we can control the temperature from 30 to 90 degrees Celsius. And we use these things called uh, milligat pumps to pump the solutions in, which we can have uh, great control over the uh, flow rate of the material. Um, so here we have a sodium citrate and tannic acid solution and aqueous silver nitrate, which is just a simple chemistry of what's occurring in this reaction. Um, the tannic acid and the sodium citrate act as a reducing agent and a capping agent at the same time. So within the um, CIJ mixer, we get rapid mixing of the liquid, which uh, starts to nucleate in our reactor. And then we add uh, more silver nitrate to grow the nanoparticles um, through this uh, splitter. Um, so as this is going along, we can uh, grow the systematically grow the uh, nanoparticles up from 20 nanometers all the way up to around about 140 nanometers with controllable uh, synthesis based upon how much silver nitrate we add and how fast we actually control the flow of the synthesis. Um, so as you see here, stage six growth. Um, so we can collect the sample or we can pass it on, which we can go do some uh, more analysis on. Or as you're about to see here is where we use sort of um, inline analysis of the UV vis. So we use a UV vis source, a, U, a Z flow cell, and then a spectrometer, which is connected up to our computer, which allows us to um, collect this, the spectra in real time. So we can see what the changes in flow rate temperature do to our material. Um, so yeah, as you see here on the, the video, we can actually see the UV vis changing in real time. So the online inline analysis of uh, nanomaterials and molecules are really important because we can use this um, automated data feedback control. So where you can make a material, get the uh, UV spectra or HPLC on the right, and then pass it back through a computer, which will then put it through an algorithm, which will alter the conditions on the left-hand side and then we'll see what are, are the changes in the UV vis. So you can get fast, rapid, um, controllable synthesis of materials um, with by using an algorithm. So it's much faster than a human doing each single experiment because it, it chooses five particular experiments and then uh, does some mathematical models to actually figure out what is the optima of the material. Uh, so this was being done in nanomaterials. So we use uh, uh, the um, Chamberlain group used uh, gold nanoparticles to do this reduction chemistry as a catalyst, basically. And then the um, Bourne group used uh, HPLC and using a multi-variable algorithm. So they're looking at very different objectives. And since there was different uh, organic steps to the reaction you could telescope the reaction in with regards to um the starting like starting product reaction uh the conditions there might be different uh depending on the the final product so that was quite quite interesting as well and then also looking at the sort of the synthesis of gold changing the shapes using this sort of uh measurement um, looking at the performance of the material, the morphology based upon the spectra and then passing it through a chemical space by changing it. So online analysis, um, inline analysis, depending on what you call it, of uh, materials is quite important and it's where sort of the future is heading. So the reason I talk to you about that is because we've, we're using this to determine uh, toxicity. So 
What is toxicity? So basically toxicity is the potential harmful effects of the materials um, inside our bodies, which we're mostly concerned about, which can target a number of areas, um, as seen on the right here. And how toxic the material is depends on how much, obviously, the person takes, um, exposure of it. So if you breathe it in or if you drink it or if it goes in your eye. Um, and the reason why we're looking at toxicity is because nanoparticles can easily penetrate the uh, cell membranes and go across the blood brain barrier. And that can accumulate in the organs leading to cellular and cystic systemic um, toxicity. So it's really important to figure out if we're making nanoparticles, uh, especially for biomedical applications, we want to make sure that the materials are not toxic. Um, but toxicity is usually screened in vitro and in vivo studies, which I commonly use. Um, they use various types of cell cultures. Um, looking at the cell viability, the the uh, genotoxicity. However, the problem with this is it takes about two to four days to make the cell culture to then try and, you know, make sure the cell culture is correct and then test the, the nanoparticles. So that's quite a long time in industry. And what the project is looking at is doing is trying to do a high throughput analysis of toxic nanoparticles. So the project before the Sabi Doma project was looking at um, making a, a high throughput analysis of toxicity, which is going to be talked about in a second. Um, so yeah. Uh, Matt, I am not sure if we are supposed to hear some audio with the. Uh, video, you guys are supposed to. You can't hear. Um, we so sorry. might not hear. So if you would uh, like to maybe provide some live commentary, yeah, that would be yeah, great. Sure, Thank sorry. you. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I can actually uh, say exactly what uh, is going on. So, so the so the cell is uh, made up of a membrane, sort of like a shell on an egg, and if if toxic particles. Um, get into them. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, if if toxic nanoparticles get into the cell, it could actually disrupt the uh, sort of the um, the cell itself, and especially like the nucleus and stuff like that. Um, uh, so what we what uh, the project was looking at was taking a, a liquid metal, which in this case is mercury, and then having the uh, lipids align on the uh, sort of the cell. Um, and what we were looking at is um, when when you apply electrical volt across it, so um, cyclic voltrometry, you actually get this nice, beautiful uh, CV peak with uh, two um, distinct peaks. Um, however, when uh, so if the particles are not toxic, they won't disrupt the uh, lipid layer. However, if the um, particles do become toxic, um, do you actually see a, dis a disruption in the um, the lipid layer where the peaks are then suppressed? And essentially, um, that means that the lipid is destroyed because of the toxicity of the materials. So this here is the, the chip that the materials go on. Um, uh, so they got some uh, of the mercury there, and this is the actual setup of the what we call the high sense uh, module. Um, oops, um, sorry, there you go. Um, and then so you have an electrode uh, there as well. I'll show you a, a schematic diagram of this in a second. Um, and then see as you see the RCV of the material. Um, yeah, so this is how it's set up so that when a toxic substance goes through the the um, actual cell, you see a, a suppression in the peaks as seen on the screen there. Um, I will actually skip on. Sorry, I thought you guys would be able to hear the, the sound because I can hear it in my ear. Um, 
Um, so that's the way the uh, the high sense biomembrane sensor works. So where the the toxic nanoparticles interact and peak suppress in the RCV. Um, so we have a, a, um, a reference electrode and a working electrode um, to make sure that the it's actually working quite well. So we use a buffer and a lipid to remake the biomembrane. And then um, we pump those through using syringe pumps, which are automatically controlled. Um, and then using the high sense software where it can actually observe if there's any sort of peak suppression in the um, RCV once we pass toxic nanoparticles through. So the um, top score, the peak suppression of of the RCV is actually quite relatable to the cell viability of um, HEP G2 and A549. So we're actually able to do a nice correlation between the score versus the top, uh, the toxicity of the particles. So um, what I'm just going to show here is uh, the coupling of the the nanoproduction line to the biomembrane sensor. So here um, we have the bio, uh, the nanoproduction line on the right hand side and the sensor on the left hand side with a um, lab computer controlling all of this. Um, so what that we use is a VG switch valve, which allows for the um, injection of the nanomaterials. We use red dye in this case to show it and passing through a sample loop which goes usually into waste, but um, if we switch, if we find nanoparticles using the UV vis, um, inline UV vis spectra, it will then pass through the um, disk line, which will then be passed through the cell, the uh, biomembrane sensor. Um, and you'll see in a second that uh, this dye is actually quite toxic. So we actually saw a nice uh, suppression of the peaks. Um, and so this can go out into waste, which it is currently at the moment, but we can also collect the samples, um, which we're doing currently at the moment. So you can see here on the screen that the peaks are completely suppressed, meaning that the particles are, are toxic and there's no lipid layer anymore. Um, so we decided to look at just some uh, silver nanoparticles um, 40 to 60 nanometers in diameter, looking at various concentrations, which we observed a higher peak suppression at higher concentrations. Um, and we're currently transferring this technology to a Bayesian optimization where we can change the conditions of the material of the synthesis to relate to how toxic the materials are. So in conclusion, we can actually um, have a controllable uh, synthesis of silver nanoparticles. We use inline uh, UV vis and inline high sense um, biomembrane sensor to observe toxicity. And we can actually um, transfer this technology into industrial settings, which we've done with um, APPNS. Um, we've transferred it to Barcelona and currently using a Bayesian optimization for the synthesis of these non toxic silver nanoparticles. Um, through a high throughput online analytical system. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge everyone on this um, um, slide, uh, especially the the um, EU for uh, giving us funding for this project as well, and PDV for producing the videos. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for your attention. And I think that'll be about it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot, Matt. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we will now go to the next presentations and we'll take uh, questions at the end. So if you have any, note them down. And uh, the next presentation is a joint one. So I will introduce both speakers uh, at the same time. So we will first have Dr. Irene Saldiber, who is the CEO of AD Particles, followed by uh, Dr. Alberto Katsumiti, who is a researcher at Geico Technology Center, and who will present us the uh, interesting collaboration on uh, their particles. Um, so Irene, whenever you want to get your presentation started, or I think it's Alberto who is going to share his screen, so we can now see it. Um, Okay. And now it's full Just screen. You know? Thank you. Yes. Oh, yep. Yeah. It's, okay. it's good now. Thank you. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Shiara and Alberto from ICAR for the opportunity to introduce ADP in this event. Well, uh, please, Alberto, next slide. Well, Advanced Dispersed Particles is a spin-off of a relevant European research institution called CESIC, which is one of the top five research institutions in Europe. ADP was founded in 2011 as a result of a patent from CESIC. ADP is a Spanish company and is located in the capital. And our commercial brand is called ADP Cosmetics. Please, next. Well, the objective of the company is to produce the first in class with a balanced high, high efficiency and broad spectrum protection of mineral UV filters for cosmetic industry. Our pillars base, uh, are based on protecting the skin and the environment. Next. Well, in the, in, the, in the way to give you our view of the company, the patent was achieved in, 20, in 29 and the company was funded in 2011. ADP is the only company with exclusive use right of the patent. The patent has different industrial applications such as catalysis, polymers, paintings, but in 2014, ADP decided to focus on cosmetic application. In this way, our manufacturing process for producing cosmetic ingredients is based on this patent. In 2015, first innovative UV filter from ADP were launched to the market. In 2016, we achieved several ISO, ISO certification and we certified our ingredients by Cosmos and Ecocell, which means that our ingredients are sustainable. In 2019, the rest of the ADP ingredients were launched to the market. In 2020, our ingredients were registered by the FDA. And finally, in 2021, 20, 20, we achieved the GMP certification. Additionally, we demonstrated new properties from our ingredients, such as protection against blue light and infrared with one on only ingredient. Next. Well, our technology based on dry dispersion methodology allows us to create new structure using different particle sites. Thanks to the patent technology that we call COSMAR, which combines technology, sustainability, and health, this new structure, which are our ingredients, are very effective and they are able to protect against total both spectrum of solar radiation with a perfect balance site being non nanoparticles with one only ingredients. Next, please. Well, Relating to our portfolio, ADP provides its innovative mineral UV filters with a balance site being non-nanometric. Now here you can see our two uh, families, our mineral filters called Engenu and our mineral pigments called Effective U. Well, if you put the attention in, in our mineral UV filters, we have two different uh, kind of filters. Our family Engenu T, composed by titanium dioxide, iron oxide and silica, um, they uh, are multifunctional ingredients because they combine color and protection in only one ingredient. Thanks to the iron oxide and the manufacturing process, these filters are able to protect against UVB, UVA, visible light, and infrared with only one ingredient. On the other side, our filter called Engenju S, uh, which is composed by zinc oxide, titanium iron oxide, and silica, is the, is the best option when when you want to, uh, to provide a transparent effect on the skin, which is a big challenge when we are speaking about mineral UV filters. On the other side, we had our mineral pigments, Effective U. They are also multifunctional because they combine color and protection in the same molecule. We, we provide to the market uh, for, for colors, white, yellow, red, and black and they are very compatible to combine with our mineral fi filters in the way to increase uh, the booster effect, no? speaking about SPF. So next, please. Well, <clears throat> this is my last, my, 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 less, uh, my last part of the presentation. And here I would like to give you an overview about the current situation of the UV filters in the market. Well, classical UV filters are uh, chemical filters. They have been used intensively, but nowadays they are being analyzed due to negative effects, such as endocrine disruptor, skin reaction, skin penetration. 
on the other side relating to the environment, even if we know that the environmental problem in, in our oceans is a multifunctional issue, the massive use, uh, use of photoprotector with several chemical UV filters is also one additional factor affecting our ocean. On the other side, we had the mineral UV filters, but in this, in, in this point, I would like to emphasize that the particle side is very important when we are speaking about mineral UV filters, because in the market, we can find inorganic nanosite mineral UV filters, which means smaller than 100 nanometers. They provide high SPF and good cosmeticity, but they don't able to provide a total broad spectrum. Uh, additionally, there are uh, some concerns speaking about the site and the potential problem or issues to the, to the health and the environment. So on the other part, we can find in the market inorganic UV filters, but with microsites. They provide low SPF whitening effect on the skin, and normally they are using more as pigment instead of UV filters. Well, currently for ADP, it's very important to, work, to, to collaborate with, with Geiker uh, because now we can understand how important it is to, to analyze very well the particle side of the UV filters, and it's, it's very important to characterize properly. For this reason, we collaborate in the way to characterize very well our particles, and additionally, to analyze the toxicity of our ingredients in comparison with chemical UV filters and mineral UV filters with different particle sites. After these studies, we can conclude that our ingredients are environmental friendly. And additionally, we also can provide a exclusive and unique advantage from our ingredients, which are able to protect in the both spectrum, uh, provide high photostability and multifunctional ingredients because they combine color and protection in only one ingredient. Well, thank you. Thank you for your attention and I give the floor to Alberto. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Alberto. Good. Well, for this uh, second part of the presentation, so uh, uh, I will start introducing Geike. Uh, some of you already know the, the technological center, but some of you know, don't, 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 still don't know. So Geike is a private and non-profit uh, organization devoted to research and, and, and development, and offer, also offering innovative technological solutions for corporations. Geike is a member of the Basque Research and Technology Alliance, uh, and the, the, the center is divided into two uh, main uh, research areas. Uh, so one of them is uh, biotechnology, and the second one is, uh, is, uh, is an area devoted to, to composites and sustainable functional uh, polymers. So uh, for this collaboration with uh, ED particles, so uh, as, as Irene already mentioned, so uh, we had uh, two main uh, focus, two main points to, to analyzing the materials. So the first one is to characterize, so to perform a, 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 um, an overview characterization of the materials. Uh, and the second one was uh, to very focus on, on the, the ecotox, so the, the, the effects to, uh, potential effects to the environment. So here I'm just showing uh, uh, quickly, very quickly, uh, the potential that we have uh, concerning the characterization of nanomaterials and advanced uh, materials. So for example, for primary and secondary characterization, so we, we, we have available several equipments and several techniques. So for example, for determine uh, the size, shape, and elemental composition of uh, the nanomaterials, um, to study, for example, secondary characterization, so the stability and behavior of the nanomaterials in different solutions, using, for example, DLS. Uh, we have also uh, spectroscopy, uh, near-infrared uh, spectroscopy, Rama spectroscopy. Um, we also perform, for example, analysis using ICPMS for composition dissolution of the particles. Um, and we also have access to additional infrastructure from the, the Basque Research and Technology Alliance, so, for example, uh, we have access to TEM for size and shape, for example, of nanomaterials, and also AFEM uh, for topography, elasticity, and lateral properties uh, of the, these nanomaterials. 
Hingaik, we also um, 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 develop, for example, experiments and assessment, for example, to, to understand the age and, and the weathering of nanomaterials. So we have available here two chambers uh, to simulate um, aging and weathering. So, for example, the first one here to simulate sunlight, temperature, humidity, and rain cycles um, for aging of, the, of materials. Uh, and the second one is a simpler one, but uh, we can also perform, for example, UVA and UVB radiation and humidity um, in, this, in these materials. In a third layer of characterization, we can also perform characterization in complex matrices. So, for example, here we, I'm showing some examples of uh, characterization of the materials in biological matrices. So uh, the first example here is the confocal laser scanning microscopy. So applied, for example, to uh, nanocarriers. So nanomaterials functionalize with um, nanodrugs for cancer treatment. So as you can see here in the first image, we are marking basically lysosomes of the cells. In the second one, marking the nanodrug and then merging to see um, the, the fates of these nanomaterials. So this is a video just showing a 3D image of a cell. So you can see that um, the nanodrug is internalized mainly in the lysosomes, but not exclusive in, the, in, this, in these lysosomes. And here, basically the same, but like in a zeta um, um, scanning, showing basically the marking of the lysosomes and also the, the nanomaterials. So in the second example here, using the TEM, so TEM, of course, we use for size, determination of size and, and, and shape of the nanomaterials, but also for to characterize, for example, um, fates in intracellular, um, um, well, intracellular fates and the subcellular localization of the nanomaterials. So in these images here, you can see um, um, basically the localization of the nanomaterials inside of the cell and also an interaction of the graphene layers with the cell, the, the plasma membrane in uh, epithelial cells. In this case here, we have um, lung epithelial cells. Right, so um, these uh, blocks that I showed here, basically like on the characterization and aging and weathering of nanomaterials are integrated in, a, in an assessment that we have for safe and sustainable by design of nanomaterials and advanced materials. So um, um, together with, this, with these two um, uh, parts of the, the, the characterization, so we also have the life cycle assessments uh, of nanomaterials and we have um, two blocks. Uh, of assessment. So one is focused on human health and the other one is in environmental health. So at the side of the human health, uh, we basically perform uh, studies to assess the safety and efficiency of the nanomaterials, of the materials and advanced materials. So focusing mainly in uh, five target systems. So central nervous system, immune system, dermal system, respiratory system, and gastrointestinal system. Uh, for it, we use basically um, in vitro models, so we, we don't perform here uh, in vivo studies, so avoiding in this way uh, the animal testing. Uh, for these in vitro um, studies, we perform uh, studies from a very simple um, systems, so using, for example, monocultures of cells, of different cell lines and primary cells. Uh, also co-cultures, we do also, also um, 3D organoids and also... Um, uh, tissue models and ex vivo models for, for these assessments. At the ecotox side, at the environmental health side, so we basically work in three uh, main um, areas. So one is uh, focused on soil toxicity, second one is focused on fresh water, and the third one is focused on marine water. Uh, so as you can see here, we use different uh, approaches. So some of them very basic approaches based, for example, uh, the microtox, which is using uh, a bioluminescence bacteria for, for the assessment of toxicity of different compounds. Um, we also uh, use uh, microalgae, for example, for these assessments, freshwater and marine water, uh, marine, uh, water microalgae. Uh, we also um, use for soil toxicity, freshwater toxicity, we use Daphnia. Um, in the case of marine uh, toxicity, we use uh, artemia. And then uh, as a third um, step in this, this assessment, we're using vitro um, as, um, models, for example, of uh, earthworms, uh, fish cell lines, and also, for example, uh, muscle uh, primary cells for the in vitro assessments of the environmental health. So uh, we have a long uh, history in the in different European projects. So using these these tools, so uh, mainly for example to assess the safety of the nanomaterials and advanced materials, 
uh, but also performing the characterization of these materials in these different projects. So it starts 10 years ago, I think it was in about like 2006 and 2007 with the first uh, European projects. Up to now, uh, in the recent projects that we have, uh, focusing different systems. So in the case of the collaboration with AD Particles, so um, we perform basically uh, um, a simple characterization of these materials. So uh, to, characterize, to characterize these materials, we use uh, SEM uh, uh, coupled with uh, ADX for uh, size, shape, and elemental analysis. We also used uh, DLS for hydrodynamic uh, size and zeta potential, and also ICPMS for this solution. Um, for the Ecotox um, assessments, we used basically species, marine species. So we used then uh, the Microtox uh, acute toxicity test based on this ISO, the Atemia toxicity test based on this, the, the, the ISO here listed as well, and the microalgae toxicity test using the Fiodactylon uh, Chikonutin. So the materials that we tested were basically split in, in two um, types of materials. So we had uh, a chemical filter, uh, EHMC, um, and then we had uh, some options of mineral filters. So we had uh, three particles, uh, individual particles, so titanium dioxide, um, zinc oxide, and zinc oxide in nanoform. And then we also have three formulations, which are basically mixtures of the, the these mineral filters in different proportion, proportions, but basically using uh, zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, and other, other metals. So we started with the results of this characterization. So uh, here, based on the uh, SEM and EDX analysis, uh, so these two images here are just representative of the, the, the materials that we, we studied. So here in the left-hand side, we have a, a very general view of the, the, um, the particles, the zinc oxides uh, bulk. So uh, here you can't see because it's, of course, it's like we don't have like details enough, but basically we have particles of uh, around 250 nanometers in size. Um, we performed the uh, EDX analysis just to confirm if this is pure um, zinc oxide or, or if this could, could um, have um, some trace elements of other, other metals, for example, but this was uh, confirmed that it's pure um, zinc oxide. In the right-hand side, we have um, the dispersion of the zinc oxides um, uh, in nanopowder, in nanoform. So uh, the main um, um, size range of these particles were around 80 nanometers. We also performed this EDX analysis to confirm if this was pure um, zinc oxide or, or to check if there was a presence of other minerals or other metals. And was the result was uh, that we had a pure zinc oxide in the sample. So following up with the characterization, so uh, the second uh, step that we performed was the LS analysis to check uh, for hydrodynamic size, uh, also for aggregation, of course, of aggregation agglomeration of the particles in the in marine water in this case, and also zeta potential. So as we can see here, based on these results, uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles and zinc oxides in bulk form um, um, agglomerate in the, in the marine water, clearly um, um, showing um, big aggregates of uh, eight microns, 12 microns, or even like 28 microns in, the, in marine water. And also the formulation one was the last stable um, um, formulation. As you can see here, showing um, um, agglomerates and aggregates of uh, around 700, 700 nanometers to 900, almost one micron um, uh, in size. So concerning the solution of this material, so this, this solution was also performed in marine, marine water. So we can see that, for example, here is just a representation of the, the, the whole um, um, experiment. So we perform um, the dissolution uh, up to 72 hours. Starting from 15 minutes, we can see that zinc um, uh, dissolves in marine water. So uh, both zinc uh, oxide uh, bulk and also zinc oxide nanoparticles dissolve in, 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 in marine water. Uh, we could also observe this, uh, this dissolution in the formulation number one. Um, so with increased amount of zinc, available zinc uh, from this formulation, uh, and titanium dioxide, for example, uh, was not uh, noticed the dissolution of this of these particles in the different formulations, and also um, in the the single uh, titanium dioxide um, sample suspended in marine water. So concerning the ecotoxicity uh, experiments, so we, you can see here in the left hand side the results of the microtox acute toxicity test. 
So we can see here again that zinc oxide uh, bulk and zinc oxide nanoparticles were quite toxic. Uh, and also the formulation number one. So formulation number one contains uh, zinc oxides. So you can see uh, uh, relatively high toxicity of this of these um, metals. This was confirmed. Well, the, the other formulations, formulations number two and three, uh, we we didn't show uh, any uh, toxicity. They didn't show any toxicity and to this to these organisms and also titanium dioxide. Um, so then, at the right hand side, we can see results in the Artemia toxicity test and also the microalgal um, toxicity test. Uh, here are also just some representations of the full uh, spectrum of the results. Of course, I'm not putting all the the, the graphs here. Uh, but just showing, for example, that the um, um, chemical filter was highly toxic to the organisms. So very low concentrations of 0 0.01 uh, micrograms per milliliter were very, very, very toxic, killing all the animals. Um, zinc oxide um, nanoparticles, for example, induced the toxicity and a higher toxicity than zinc oxide in bulk form. Um, this toxicity was uh, more evident at um, 48 hours compared to 24 hours. And similar results were observed uh, with the microalgae test. Um, the microalgae was, was less um, um, sensitive than the artemia, for example, in, this, in these exposures. We can see um, an effect of the chemical filter, but was not that evident as in the artemia, for example. Um, but we can confirm that um, the chemical filter was more toxic um, to, the, to the organisms compared to the, the rest of the, the, the mineral filters. Uh, and concerning the mineral filters, the nano um, zinc oxide was the highest uh, toxic uh, mineral filter. So as general conclusions, uh, we, could, uh, we could see that SCM uh, combined with EDX analysis confirmed the size uh, and elemental composition of the samples. Uh, the dissolution uh, assessments confirmed that the micro and nanoparticles of uh, zinc oxide and zinc oxide uh, nanoparticles dissolved. Uh, quite quickly in the in the medium, uh, which is in this case marine water, um, zinc oxide, both in nano and micro form, uh, they are basically important contributors to the toxicity of these mineral filters. Uh, nano forms were generally more toxic than the micrometric uh, ones, and uh, well, basically safer formulations should avoid um, the chemical filter EHMC. And among the mineral filters, titanium dioxide uh, seems to, to be a safer option compared to the, to the, to the, to the other ones. Uh, and also micro-sized particles um, were preferred rather than uh, nano-sized uh, particles. So here's the, just the last uh, slides um, with uh, our contacts. So if you have any doubts, if you have any question or interest in, in the work, you can uh, send, an e send us an email. Uh, and just to announce, for example, that from this collaboration, we are um, um, preparing, well, we prepare uh, an abstract for, for the CTAC uh, meeting. So this work will be, will be presented uh, as a spotlight presentation in the CTAC uh, meeting in Dublin in uh, April or May uh, this year. So thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Alberto. Thanks a lot. Um, all right. So I think with that, I will just uh, quickly put my uh, cover slide back on to the screen and um, open the floor to questions if, uh, if there are any. So as I mentioned at the beginning, you can either raise a virtual hand, unmute yourself and ask the question directly, or uh, type it in the chat if, uh, if you prefer. Oh, sorry. Um, I have a question, Alberto. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Okay. I, I have seen that you did uh, this dissolution in environmental uh, media. Do you think it's also relevant in the future to check biological fluids from, you know, lung lining fluid or lysosomal uh, fluid? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, for example, I think is uh, this is something that we do. I mean, I'm not showing this. Uh, I didn't show these results here because this was very focused on ecotox, but definitely uh, we can do it. So for example, in the case of uh, nanocarriers, this is uh, really, really relevant because uh, it's uh, one of the mechanisms explored, for example, for the uh, for the efficiency of this of these nanodrugs. 
um, in this in the, in the case here showed, for example, in these images and also in the 3D um, in image analysis, you can see that this, uh, these nanodrugs were developed mainly to, to end up in the lysosomes of the cells. As we know, for example, the lysosomes uh, are very acidic uh, organelles of a pH of around 5.5. Uh, so this is very, very relevant to understand what happened in this, uh, in this uh, acidic environment as well. Okay, so it's very interesting to know that Gaika can do these experiments because, you know, these are the initial steps in those uh, IATAs, um, which help you grouping, so you can wave further experiments. Absolutely. But, uh, we always have these theoretical approaches, but it's really hard to find labs who can perform the experiments. So, uh, yeah, that's just really nice to hear. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I have a uh, hand raise, uh, Christian Hill. You can go ahead and ask your question. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi. Yeah, thank you for the presentations. Uh, very, very nice. I have one quick question. Is uh, the size, you basically said the size, of course, is important for toxicity. Uh, I have not seen any concentration data because uh, I assume it's also dependent on concentration. The same question also goes for the first presentation with the uh, membrane. I think this is also a concentration uh, kind of dependent process. Can you come in, comment on this? So I think yeah. it, just um, to address the question to the second presentation, so our presentation, yes, you're right, Christian. Um, um, of course, here we try to um, um, quickly show um, the results, so not focusing too much, like in the the methodology. Um, but this is um, this is something that we performed before. So the first step that we did, for example, for this for these experiments, was to assess uh, was basically to to screen, you know, a very wide range of concentrations, uh, to then define, you know, a specific concentration range of concentrations to work with. So basically, in these experiments, we did uh, the exposures to up to 100 micrograms per milliliter. And of course, if we increase the concentration of these different uh, metals, uh, of course, the toxicity will definitely increase, not just in the, the atemia, but also in the microalgae. In, uh, um, because, of course, it's, it's, it's um, concentration dependent. Uh, um, it was especially interesting, for example, comparing the chemical filters with the mineral filters. Because the chemical filter is very, very toxic at a very long of concentration, but in the case of particles, definitely yes. So um, in this, in, in 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 the approach here, we try to find um, a range of concentration that we can test it, that we can test um, the zinc oxide samples, uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles, but also the titanium and all the metals to then cover you know all the range of uh, toxicity of these metals. So um, it's more or less the approach. Thank you. Um, perhaps Matt also wants to address the question. Yeah. Um, yes. So, so what we did also was look at uh, a set size, 40 to 60 nanometers of our silver nanoparticles and then varied the concentrations. Um, as Alberto said, the concentration does have an effect on with regards to toxicity. Um, we are sort of um, overcoming that by putting a set standard concentration into our sample loop using the Vici valve. So we've made the Vici valve um, two meters long, which can hold about two mil of liquid. Um, and that then, when we pass it through the, the uh, sensor, all we're getting is not a change in concentration, but it can change in size, which is semi a, a change in concentration obviously so we're going to try and decouple those two sort of things and that's what we're currently doing as well but we're trying to look at the size and the coating effect with regards to tannic acid and sodium citrate on the silver nanoparticles in regards to the toxicity of the of the nanoparticles thank you, uh, thank you. one quick question uh, follow up question and then uh, would it be interesting to really uh, measure concentration as in objects per volume? Uh, is there a benefit to this? Uh, uh, yes, yeah. so I think we've done some ICPMS um, and some concentration stuff. Um, I didn't show it, but that could be another a variable that we could look at. So we could do a multi-variable um, algorithm where we're looking not only at the size, but also the concentration of the material as well. Um, that's a very good uh, question. Thank you.
Thanks. When people um, think of, of additional questions, I would have a, a quick one um, again for Matt, uh, more of a broader one, because you mentioned uh, your collaboration with this company in the context of the Sabidoma project. It would be interesting to also know when the project is scheduled to conclude and what kind of uh, output would be instead available to like more, more broadly, because that would be interesting to have in mind. Yeah, um, so we are uh, aligned with a number of companies um, on the continent, um, Fraun, Fraunhofer, um, Rescoil, and um, a couple of other ones, um, including the uh, APP and S um, in, in Barcelona. Um, it, the pr project, I think, is supposed to be concluding uh, this time next year because uh, of just of COVID, we've got an extension on the um, project. Um, and if you want more information, you actually, if you type in Savvy Doma um, in your Google search, it actually comes up with a website on all the different projects that we are currently looking at. My project is one of, one of I think, eight different work packages that are, are currently on this uh, massive EU project. Um, and my sort of role is to make the nanoparticles and look at the toxicity with another postdoc at, here at Leeds and then transfer that technology to the um, partners um, such as, yeah, Fraunhofer and um, APP and S. So, yeah. yeah. So, so I suppose the the full outcome of the, of the um, sort of project is sort of that uh, technology readiness level, that ladder to make sure that the technology can go from a lab setting like I'm sitting in right now to um, to industrial settings or to uh, sort of private company settings um, such as Alberto is at, at and so we can sell them our technology as such. Thank you. And to see if anyone has additional questions. I think all the presentations were very exhaustive then. Um, so that I would then just go to uh, a couple of uh, closing points. Sorry, that was too quick. So um, just as I mentioned, you will receive the materials and recordings after the event. Uh, you will also see in the chat a link to a survey, uh, which is literally for questions. And the last one is optional. Uh, so it will not require more than five minutes of your time, but if you could take the time to fill it in, that ensures that we can continue to make the content of the future webinars uh, relevant to you and your organizations. And you can also register already for the next webinar in the series, which will look at the topic of antimicrobial treatment. So the needs of companies and entities that manage public transport and hospitals, uh, what kind of nano-based solutions exist to ensure uh, antimicrobial treatment, and also how do we measure the efficacy of, of treatment. So um, with that, I would like to thank one, once again the speakers who took the time to uh, talk to us today, uh, everyone for participating, and have a very good rest of the day and a very nice week. Thank you.